Hello all, we're going to do a session on data interpretation. Like uh, we've done the previous occasion, we're going to do a bunch of charts, have a look at them, and then see what inferences we can make from them. And so the idea here is to see what we can draw from a graph. The computational part of data interpretation is uh, nailed on well. That is important, crucial, critical for this exam. There's no underestimating that. But the, the exam style has shifted over the last couple of years, 2015 and 16 particularly, where the, the DA has a certain element of puzzle cracking, a certain element of just getting a sense of what does this data say, what inferences can it draw from here, that aspect of it. So we're going to focus on, say, seven to eight graphs today. Uh, maybe do it a slightly quicker clip than how we did it last time around, and then see how we can make inferences out of the diagrams, out of what we've got to see. So we look at a chart and say, look, what does this chart tell us? That's what that's what we're going to focus on today. So I'm going to share these charts. I'm going to go on and share my screen, and then once that is done, we'll carry on with this. So I hope all of you can uh, see the screen. If you if you cannot, please comment on the YouTube video. My colleague should be on the video, and he will be able to help you out and say, at least come and tell us that we're doing something wrong. Mental. It's a very interesting chart. I'm not going to say much about the chart. I'm just give you a broad outline. So the trickiest part in DA these days is to get a sense of what the chart is saying. It's not laid out on a platter, but the, the data set is uh, counterintuitive. It is not clear, not obvious what's happening. And so we'll need to see unconventional data presentations and, and start making sense of them. That's very vital. And so make sure that you pick up that habit as quickly as possible and get as much practice as possible for that. Right. Now, what does this mean? What does this chart say? What does this convey? And it says poorest bottom 20%, that's in dark blue. Middle is in middle in color, richest is in darker shade of blue. And so uh, the, the, the chart itself makes it clear what you're talking about here. This diamond type of thing is the average. So we're talking about uh, countries similar to India, Peru, India, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand. And what are the bottom 20% doing? What are the middle 40 to 60% doing? What is the average? What are the richest top 20% doing? And so, as you can see, this is the kind of pattern of how much education they're getting. They're not really looking into what quality of education they're getting. So we're not referring to how well they spend the few hours they spend in class. So that's a separate new dynamic. Uh, and it's probably a good thing that we're not seeing that in India. We're not verifying that. Because I don't know whether India would have better if that were taken that on. My own gut feel is for all the investments we've done in uh, in and tech in India and in ed tech, this mythical sector. Uh, we, 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 we are probably our qualitative inputs are even worse. But that is discussion for another day. But if you look at this, first up, you can see that the the average numbers, India is not doing too well. India is here. The other countries are much further apart, much more ahead. And that's, that's important to see that. That's the first inference. The average gives you a good insight about what's happening. And so on an average, we lag behind in education. That's not the only inference, that's not the only important point. So if you see this, for a country that is lagging behind, the variance here is huge. Think about that. What does that tell us? What this number compared India and Vietnam? So I have to say, look at India and Vietnam, and look at the, the darker circles, forget the average. What does this tell us about the way the Indian education system is set up, the way the whole apparatus works and what is the inference that you can draw by looking at that. This variance is frightfully small, whereas this is gigantic, ginormous. This, this talks about nothing about inequality. A lot of, uh, every country in the world has inequality, some border. And so we talk about inequality of outcomes, inequality of starting points, inequality of opportunity. And so. Uh, capitalist system says we give equality of opportunity. They're not looking at equalizing end outcomes. What they mean by that is we provide everybody with the same opportunity. 
and the better guys do better. We won't prevent them from doing better than being better. It's a, it's a mythical idea that never happens. So in, in very capital, in heavily capitalist societies, where inequality is not frowned upon, where they say that they'll provide equality of opportunity, they don't. So richer guys have a better advantage in almost everything they do. So, but the claim is we're not equalizing outcomes, we're equalizing opportunity. And that is the idea. So, the opportunity is how well you are geared in tracking the opportunity that's going to be provided by the economy when you become a qualifier as an earning member. Effectively, there is access to education. If you think about this, India has a huge gap between the poor and the rich. Are the people who are poor today are going to continue to have a disadvantage later on because their education difference with the guys who are rich today is enormous, is extraordinarily high. And so that's a very important factor. The, the, I would expect, this, this is not, I'm not talking about a specific case here, this number being this narrow basically tells us that the state plays a huge role in providing education. State is guaranteeing education of a certain level of quality for a huge number of its citizens. That's what that, that small gap is saying. That's amazing. That's fabulous. That's wonderfully good because that sets up the base for the next generation. There's a state that's having a stake in how well educated its citizens are. So, Thailand and Philippines and Indonesia are doing better. They're doing more, but the divergence is more. So I'd argue they have better quality, but probably not more equality. As India is studying, it's the probably the best country which would have a very small gap between this and this in education would probably be Cuba. Strongly urge you to look at that and say Cuban education system, Google that. It is fabulous. Their education system sometimes runs from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. They keep children in school for 12 hours. They feed them uh, multiple meals. They give them a chance to play, home, be free, everything. So their child care system is comprehensive. They're a poor country, uh, but their, their education system is fabulous. And so and that is a huge equalizer. Because if the, if the rich kids spend 11 hours in school, and the poor kids spend 11 hours in school, they spend the same 11 hours in the same school, and they're being given the same inputs the same set of teachers who don't give a damn whether they're rich or poor. That's going to be huge for the next generation in terms of equalizing opportunity. It's very vital. In India, for all our talk about equalizing opportunity, this, this divergence is, is, a, is a killer. This tells us that the state input into Indian education is either abysmally low or abysmally poor. In India's case, it is both. Our education spending as a percentage of GDP is, 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 is better not spoken of. And the quality of teachers in our central government and state government and public schools is very poor. And so that, that is very vital. That is why not only is this number low, the divergence between this number and this number is very large. And unless that divergence is brought down, unless this number creeps up, we are always going to have trouble. In the next generation. We, this, we spoke about this in the previous thing as well. We talked about demographic dividend and demographic nightmare. If you have a lot of people coming into your workforce and your workforce average is here, very good. If you have a lot of people, young guys, 18, 19, 20, coming into the workforce and your education average is here, we are bringing in people who are, good, who are enthusiastic, who are uh, who are going to work, who have the willingness and inclination, but are just not capable of picking up the right kind of job which the global economy provides. So we are going into an integrated global economy world uh, and putting a lot of money in integrating ourselves, but not enough time, money or energy into improving the quality of our workforce. And that, that's a big, big blind spot India has had. It's been a blind spot India has had since the 1940s. Indian education spending as a percentage of GDP it's probably one of the blind spots Nehru had. We continue to have it. Hopefully, at some point of time, we'll wake up to the study. Maybe, maybe tech can bridge that gap. Maybe tech can can play a role in cutting costs so much that this will automatically go up. That we can help this climb, which it pushed us forward. Indian rich kids do all right, but Indian poor kids can so, There's quite a lot of uh, 
discussions for this. So which country is doing the best? It's clear that Thailand, they have their average numbers high, their overall number high, their number high. They're doing a good job in all three, so they're doing the best. Which country is likely to be run by socials? Probably Vietnam. Socialism is effectively making sure that the difference between the rich and the poor is not so huge. The redistribution or the redistributive effects of uh, of the government, in the, at least in the education sector, is working as far as Vietnam is concerned. So, I'm not talking about what system they're following, I'm saying what the graph is telling me. It's not a political commentary, this is a graph analysis. Right? So, which country is doing worse on many metrics? The one thing has been we've had one big impact is demonetization. We've taken us to thousand rupee notes and sorry, a thousand rupee notes and five hundred rupee notes and pinned them completely, practically overnight. We have re-monetized our economy. What does demonetization tell? What does it telling us? And that's, a, that's an important thing. We have four charts which from the Financial Times, decent article outlining it. I think no credit checks. There's not heavy duty insight. But interesting stuff about our economy, which you can read about and then make inferences on what this is done to our country. Right? And what, what that means about the, what that has meant about the underlying economy. Let's see this. First up, it is expected to boost bank deposits, published long ago. So a lot of predictions here have already been borne out by facts. Most of the predictions have played out. They're not rock star predictions. Very plain, simple, plain vanilla, simple prediction, but they did work. And the, the amount of cash in the economy is the amount of high transaction cash in the economy which had to go back into the system in one form or another. There's the estimated amount from here that people expect would continue to stay in the system. What is meant by that? You have 5 lakhs in your in terms of 2 lakhs, 1000 rupee note, 500 rupee note. So you put all 5 lakhs into the bank. Now you have a 5 lakh deposit sitting there. And once you have that, once the demonetization cycle is over, once the economy is re-monetized, you do withdraw some cash, but you probably withdraw 2 lakhs. The remaining 3 lakhs is an incremental number, which is suddenly new to the system, which the banking system is now seeing that it did not see when the old notes were in circulation. So this is a net boost in terms of deposits coming into the system. This means that the amount of money available for banks to lend and borrow and all kinds of stuff is increased like okay. this. This is big, this is huge because is suddenly there is a huge supply of money which banks did not expect to bring back into the fold. And so all of this will generate interest, which is good for people. But they had remember they had chosen to not generate interest from this. Which means that generating interest is a mild positive, there's some other negative that's going to come for them. They had taken this decision to not show this. Right? But that's from the people point of view. From the banking point of view, if you were dealing with the banking sector which was this big, no, I'm dealing with the banking sector that is bigger. There's more money into the system. The immediate impact that happened when there was interest rates fell. Supply was there. The banks had money to lend to people. So therefore, they could give it out. And so they could give out loans for education, this and big bank projects and all that. So the demand was not huge, but the supply was there. So the rates fell, which is it's a good thing in one sense, uh, that, that you could invest in projects which might otherwise not have been profitable. But all other things set aside, it was a good deal for banks because the size of their balance sheet just expanded. The amount of business, banks' business is based on what pot of money they have. There's so much pot of money to deal with in terms of deposits, they had slightly more. They had to go through the hassle of collecting the money and depositing it and maintaining this and introducing new tech and tracking and all that. But plain vanilla, it helped because the amount transacted just increased immediately. It was a boost to the banking sector. And so the banking deposits that came in were useful. But did it translate to the rest of the economy? It would have translated to the rest of the economy if this increased supply of bank system, funds coming into the banks, could be deployed outside in useful projects. 
in viable projects. And when you could, the bank doesn't want to give a loan just because it has the money. The bank should have the money and they should be able to lend to people who need the money and will spend the money wisely. So the second part of the jigsaw was also important, which is the, the other component here, which is with the property financing. We'll come to that. Where the money could be given, the biggest bank loan avenues for uh, at least retail purchases. What do you take a loan for? For education or for buying a house? Buying a house, that idea unfortunately took a big hit with demonetization. So banks had the money, their sheets, balance sheets expanded, they could lend, but they found that one very interesting avenue of lending uh, to have some roadblocks in it. That's one aspect of it. Second thing, this is the aspect of cleaning up our balance sheets. This, this number says good for banks. This is the jewelry stocks, which, which, which you want what's happening in the jewelry sector in the previous two years, and then what happened after demonetization? It crashed. It crashed significantly. It crashed a very sizable percentage. Why? Think about it. All of these, what does this tell us? This tells us one very interesting point about the jewelry business. So, this is telling us that the jewelry business would shrink. Indians are not suddenly going to be turned off from gold and silver. I am just still best friend. So it's not like the jewelry idea went away. The jewelry business shrank. How so? Why so? Think about it. Why will the jewelry business shrink just because you're demonetized? What does this tell us about the jewelry industry? This tells us that the jewelry industry was a fabulous, fabulous place to park cash and get something for it. So if you had cash for which you are not pay taxes or not accounted for in your house and you want to do something with it and jewelry was brilliant for such a high ticket item the percentage of transactions in cash is extraordinarily high in the jewelry industry so if you go to a grocery store your average outlay is 300 400 500 bucks you pay cash understandable you buy vegetables 400 bucks 500 bucks you pay cash that's understandable but you you go to a a big mall and you buy shopping, you go shopping for Diwali, you know, buy six sets of dresses for the entire family, you probably swipe your card. You say, look, 15, 18K, I'm not carrying that much cash, let me use my card. But you buy jewelry for 25 grand, 30 grand, 35 grand, you don't swipe your card. In the way the industry works is for that transaction, I don't swipe a card, I take cash, I take two lakhs with me. To a jewelry shop, notwithstanding the risks of carrying that much cash around, and give that in cash in hand to some guy who then counts using a fabulous note counting machine and then gives me the, the, the card and guarantee all kinds of stuff for and the jewelry along with it. What does this tell us? Why do we not swipe? This is not the swiping cost one and a half, two percent. Almost every bank worth its salt will give you, will give, will have special links with jewelry dealers. Any which way you can take a debit card and this issue will be out. And so it is predominantly the Indian jewelry industry was held up for a long time. It has been held up, it's still being held up as a good place to park money. So if you're a guy who's, who's taken your, 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 your real estate office guy as part of Metro Development Authority India and you take some cash on the side, the best place to park it. You have three, four, five lakhs somewhere in your house, in your cupboard. And you say, look, I, I can't pay taxes. I cannot say this is my income. I'm a government employee. How am I going to get five lakhs of income? I can keep spending on groceries and stuff, but how am I going to spend five lakhs over the next three months on, on cash items? So what do I do? One morning, one fine evening, I go out and buy a big necklace for 2.5 lakhs. Job done. I can I can wrap it around. So it's useful. And nobody can come back and say, when did you buy this, how did you buy this? Because I can always say, I inherited from my aunt, I don't know where she lives right now. And so it's just, this is money becoming something else and therefore losing its history. And so that's a fabulous, fabulous avenue. So the jewelry stocks falling, it's clearly it's a, it's a nice proof for uh, the fact that there's it it was quite a bit of black money in the system. So this chart tells us that not only was there a lot of black money in the system, but the jewelry industry was a fabulous way to park it in. What other industry can you think of? Property. So real estate is 
the, uh, this is the estimated number from from some source that illicit cash corresponds to 20 percent of the industry um, call me a cynic but i think it's closer to 30 35 percent i i i have to find verify that to some source but i think we are understating it when you say that 20 percent is illicit cash so you buy a house for 60 lakhs usually you end up paying 15 17 lakhs in, in some kind of cash or cash equivalents and then pay the remaining of the, the loan register it for lesser pay lesser duty and taxes registration fees and all of that and so the property market was another fabulous place to take your cash out of the system and make that cash lose its history so the house is registered only for 45 lakhs so you the 15 lakhs which you gave to the other guy has disappeared from the entire system right that means but that doesn't mean you will sell it at 48 two years down the line the selling price will still be 65 68 because everybody knows that there is a registration price and an actual price everybody in india knows that and therefore the illicit cash is a necessary part of that so if you're a guy who doesn't have access to illicit cash you cannot be part of the real estate trade in india really mainly because you you buy and you sell the guy who is buying will have illicit cash and if you want to buy the guy who's selling will want illicit cash because he wants to reinvest in real estate what will you do with such a huge non-illicit pot and so therefore the industry was going to have reached a point where it was impossible to survive without track one and track two because track one and track two were very essential it, it became a tough industry to be there for for, for many people and so with the big bank financing coming in large products coming in large projects which were themselves bank finance coming in the illicit cash was getting squeezed out of the system if the bigger builders brought something to the table apart from just managing illicit money and with this with the monetization has been given another much so, but the government probably need to stay on its toes and, and, and keep looking at it but this number is interesting that 20 percent of all transactions in the real estate market transaction values to illicit cash retail has got hit uh, when, when demonetization happened because you used to take 10k 15k and go think about buying a music system or take 20k and think about buying a washing machine now you couldn't do that because you didn't have the cash to do anything beyond buying simple vegetables and medicines and so everybody was in a cash squeeze for quite a while so november 8 was when it was introduced it was a, it was a three month four month lag till cash was the liquidity was restored which basically means unless it is an emergency you are not going to use your existing cash which means that if i want to buy a washing machine i probably say look you have a children why do i need to go buy one right now let me buy it when my when then the cash position is ready so the retailers got hit got hit reasonably powerfully because the three month period was a lot of the prediction then and been reasonably bone out the theory was that e-commerce would be a would see a big boost it was in two planks one is e-commerce is online therefore not cash dependent and two e-commerce would gain share because if cash was not there what's the point of going to the nearby store might as well buy it on, online okay but it turns out that a lot of e-commerce in india was still cash on delivery e-commerce also took a hit because the prepaid orders went up the, the, the the credit card debit card orders went up but the cash on delivery market shrank the overall number shrank apparently e-commerce guys were still happy with demonetization because longer term they gained this customer base which would otherwise not come and then they made a habit out of the customer base coming on like they were gaining share and anyway our e-commerce industry in india is uh, is heavily built on the myth that the customer base is important nobody cares about how much money you make so they gain share which is the driving metric for them and over the longer term the cash on delivery component is shrinking and the and the direct online card payment component is increasing and therefore it just gave a nudge to that they were happy the other industry that was very very happy was the payment uh, payment gateway and your uh, wallet industry or uh, the, the wallet money industry they got a huge boost from demonetization because they were in work everybody wanted to transfer money everybody needed to transfer money and just work really well 
and so interesting data points, interesting ideas. We've all seen demonetization. We've all seen what works, what didn't work. A bunch of three, four charts which had, which were from the FT, which are used. Have a look at these two charts. Have a have a sense of what this is. I'm going to give about three, four minutes so that you get a sense of what these charts mean, and then we'll have a quick discussion. I'm going to be not talking for about two to three minutes. So, so you can wind your head around these two charts. We discussed something very similar to this in the, in the previous session as well. A very interesting couple of charts, again from the economist. So have a look at that and then we'll discuss them. Two charts given here, number of men expected to marry, want to marry per 100 women expected to want to marry, and sex ratio at birth. And so it's a uh, two reasonably interesting charts, which talks about a prediction and hard facts, both of that. So the right hand side is the current graph, on the left hand side is the predicted graph. And so both of these are interesting. Both of these give you a sense of together what do they mean, what do they convey. That's what we are looking at. It. The title is a little bit of a giveaway. Um, I think you've got you've had some time. We're going to discuss this. Voice per hundred girls. This part we've already seen. Voice per hundred girls. India has 110. China has even more. The fact that this is higher than the natural ratio and much higher than the natural ratio tells that the societies have a natural bias towards wanting a voice so they're doing something to doctor it we already discussed what that something is they're telling us that some of our female children uh, girls are being killed even before they're born and it's the most plain way to express that as but that is happening this chart tells us that if you take the worst case scenario this and this number by say 2060 india's worst case scenario for every 100 women expected to want to marry, 170, 180 plus men who want to marry. And so 2050, for every woman who wants to marry, every 100 women, but 180 who will want to marry. 2040, still higher. The worst case scenario. Even the best case scenario is not very flattering. Right. So this number is low. The ratio of women. 100 men is less than number of girls born to every 100 boys is less and there are more boys who want to marry so if you're talking about 2010 somebody being born here in this year probably thinking about marrying in 2035 this year you take a middle middle age scenario which is here and for every 100 women or 165 men want to marry and for every 100 girls that were born here, there were about 100, 111, 112 boys that were born. So there are more men and more of them want to marry. There are fewer girls and fewer of them can want to marry. If you combine these two ratios, it gives you a staggering statistic. It is quite likely that, say, 20 years from now, for every two boys, every two men who are there who say, look, I am young and I want to marry. I'm interested in this holy matrimony. There's going to be only one girl who says, I am young, I'm the right age, I want to marry. And so it's a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous statistic. I don't know what are the basis for the number of men expected to want to marry. Number, it could be just one hypothetical chart somebody has thrown up on a lazy day's work. But if that is even remotely conceivable, it's a remote basis to it. Then we are, we are looking at a, a social strong point of So the, the two guys who want to get married, there's only one woman that would want, want to get married as soon as say 20 years from now. So that is what these two charts are telling us. So one good thing that may come out of all this is that there's an enormous shift in bargaining power from boys to girls. I'm already hearing that that is happening in quite a few of these. Uh, 
matrimonial sites and, and, and the matrimonial site interactions. Lots of funny stories and different forums where, where boys get rejected for seemingly trivial reasons and, and girls have a better choice basket than boys do. So that, that reversal is interesting, good, probably, and I don't know, but good, but it's interesting. And so, but that, that apart from a social context, if this is what it's going to come to, then we're in for a world of trouble. Already the West, they're saying that there's a huge chunk of uh, working class male population that feels betrayed and, 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 and kind of isolated and, and, and cast aside. The number of women who want to be single mothers and just carry on with their lives is, is increasing steadily in the West. And they're basically saying, look, I no longer need a, need a guy, I don't want this. So this is the guy who used to feel very nice about being the breadwinner and the guy who ran the family and had a sense of responsibility and being the guy who went out there and worked. The job prospects are worse, marriage prospects are probably therefore worse or independently worse. The, if automation comes in and there are more men and, and, and more of them less qualified to work and not inclined to work in some kind of job that are available, with fewer women available, and fewer women interested in marrying men. It could be one fabulously powerful, extraordinarily toxic social combo with good economic headwinds coming from, from automation and the rest of it. So there could be this giant urban or quasi-urban male population in India, which is very keen to work and very keen to settle down in conventional forms after starting to work extraordinarily ill-equipped to work in the sector, finding itself with no jobs in the non-automated end of the raw, unskilled, manpower-based segment, therefore making them worse off in a competitive marriage market where the demand supply equations starkly against them. And this could happen as quickly as 20 years from now. And so it's a ticking time bomb in many ways. So. Men left alone for three days, probably going to come up with interesting ideas of destroying something. I'm just joking. Uh, I, but this is something that we need to keep in mind because this is a this is a huge, huge factor that could come and hit India without, without us realizing what it is. Right? It's uh, this is not just an India problem. The, this is scenario across the world. The, the sex ratio at birth thing is not as skewed in the West as it is in India. But this expected to want to marry number is, is already there in the West, already facing this problem. So quite a few right wing movements and movements that are there bordering on slightly extremist things. Uh, the underpinning reason, the reason underlying it could be this. And we are not even into the first generation of automation. People have not yet lost a huge number. At least a large number of people have not yet lost their jobs to automation. Automation and AI are the next big things. They are not upon us now. And already we are finding this issue that the job prospects are skewed. And in 20 years time, the whole world could be facing this problem with developing countries with skewed sex ratios face being worse off. Right. So is polyandry going to be the in thing in 2050? So go on, look that up. If you don't know what polyandry means, you should look it up. An interesting idea. <laughs> The gender ratio being what it is, which we need, which we need, we need to know, we understand that. The economics and the gender ratio, both put together, could, give, could set us up for a pro proper toxic cocktail. So the next one. Again, have a look at this. I'm not going to give a uh, long-winded discussion of this before you've seen the chart. So have a look at the chart and then we'll discuss it. Very interesting chart. Have a look and then we'll discuss it.
very interesting chart on the right hand side axis is gdp per capita per person at purchasing power parity percentage change over a four year cycle and how much has lifestyle improved at an average level gdp purchasing power parity per capita is is how much more is each person earning after adjusting for inflation in this gd in, in this country so if the person at 2011 the, the easiest of the best proxy in gdp in economic terms for lifestyle improvement this percentage growth in gdp per capita on, on real basis like removing inflation that's the number you're looking for that is one input. There is a big sense of well-being that comes with it. The higher that number is, the better you feel about wealth. On the y-axis is globalization is a force for good. Percentage agreeing. The percentage of people agreeing to this premise is a force for good. If you notice this, it's a very that, that blue dotted line graph. Like if you've done a regression analysis and you're plant, planting that graph, it's conveying a very vital very vital piece of information. It basically says it's just feeling good about how the economy has grown. You're going to say globalization is good. Very simple idea. If you if you're feeling good about yourself, you're saying your life is good, we are growing, the economy is good, then you're going to say globalization is good. If things are not going your way, if things are not, you're not happy, the economic growth is not as good as it could have been, then you are likely to say, Globalization has screwed me up. It's completely buried me. I'm not happy with this at all. So, very interesting if you see countries like France here, or the United States, in Britain. But the GDP change per person has been there, but not been huge. Then the number of people agreeing that globalization is good. There are people probably in France and US who are peeved with globalization, who, who feel that this is this is this is not good for us. We are losing out on this race. And that is what is reflected here. What do you think will lead? What do you think this will result in? People in the country feel that globalization is not good for them. They are losing out in some form. This will lead to what we are calling what is being fondly referred to as economic nationalism, which is what Mr. Donald Trump is exposing. It's basically saying, I, I am US, I am good, this is what I do, America first. I don't want to be the guy helping others out and spending money out of my own pocket. I might be big, but I, I refuse to be taken advantage of. I don't want to spend money keeping the world happy. I want to make myself clear. I want to be happy myself. I don't want to be there and available as a global policeman. This is the rhetoric. What do they want to do? They want to spend less money on NATO. They want others to spend more money on military. They want to increase tariffs. They want to push against imports of goods in different countries. They want other countries to buy more American goods because it's the terms of trade would therefore be better and America would treat them better. They're doing all kinds of stuff to increase trade values. If you start feeling globalization is bad, you want to wind back the clock on it. You want the, the Americans are basically saying uh, Trump is going out and saying if you establish a factory in the US, you'll get good tax breaks. Saying there's an incentive to bring industry back to the United States. It's happening in the US. Britain had Brexit. It was they basically said, Look, I don't I don't want to be part of you. I want to do things my own way. So the economic nationalism is high here. Countries like India, which have grown well, we like to basically saying look this is good stuff let's have more integration let's have people traveling more let's have um, more far less visa regulations you can say look we'll send out people more with that no none of this h1 b l1 and all all that give us more of that we, we like globalization we see what has done to us we like we're liking it let's have more of that that's what the india seems to be arguing for so the other point that is interesting here is percentage foreign born population so in india it is lesser it's an interesting mild correlation where the foreign born population being lesser 
they are the ones who who seen globalization as a force for good. Being higher, they are the ones who are slightly less comfortable with that idea. Effectively, there is a link to immigration and attitudes to immigration as well here. Countries that are not facing an immigration problem seem to like globalization. Countries that seem to be facing an immigration problem, or at least imagining an immigration problem, are the ones who are less happy with globalization. One is the economic impact of, of, of importing uh, finished goods from a poorer country or exporting your own industry to some other country. America is very deep that the auto industry in the US delivering to the US market is sometimes located in Mexico. A theme that what should have been rightfully their employment, their revenues, their taxes is now across the border because it is cheaper there. The other thing that we have about is there are so many people from different countries that come to live here. So I don't like that from a, from a, from a, from a cultural point of view, immigration is getting on my nerves. From an economic point of view, the, the unfair trade equation is getting on my nerves. That's what this is saying. India is saying, I'm not facing any immigrant problem. We face short-term immigrant problems and there's some crisis in our neighboring country. We are not looking at a huge flow of economic migration into India, therefore affecting the cultural fabric. That's not happening. We're not even seeing that. And growth-wise, we're seeing good growth. So therefore, we seem to like the good parts of globalization. We want more of migration free, lobbying for the visa regulations being less than the rest of it. And so there's an interesting dynamic. Geopolitically, you can sense what can happen here in India and what can happen in the US and, and Britain. Brexit and Mr. Trump's economic nationalism and make America great again, America first foreign policy. All of those are in some way pinned on this. Uh, a large size economy with significant foreign born population with the mild fear of immigrants swamping in and changing the culture and this mild paranoia of losing out an economic ground because the terms of trade are not favorable to you have all contributed to globalization being a bad word or not being seen favorably by American citizens. And therefore, America takes a lot of efforts to wind back the clock on that. So, interesting to see how views on globalization are linked to the, your economic well-being and your immigration. If you do not see huge integration, you're seeing good growth, you like globalization, what not to like. If it's the opposite, then you'll start, you not like it. So it's, a, it's an interesting graph that talks about that, both of these trends. Super, now we go to tech territory. This is also fun. In top five, in one way or the other, top five tech companies, how they get their revenues. Interesting, interesting graph. So, it's a fabulous graph. It gives you enormous insight on this. So look up this chat. It's a good description on, on what's happening there. And so all of these by market capitalization are gigantic. They contribute to a huge proportion of uh, the market capitalization of the of, of NASDAQ in the US. So Apple, we all know what they do. Alphabet is effectively Google. Microsoft, we know what Microsoft does. Facebook and Amazon. Is the companies right? so they, they are all heavily valued they're extraordinarily rich companies and so if you look at this apple has iphone ipad mac other service other and services which they offer they just have a look at these charts and i'm saying what might what, what the inferences you can draw from this so very interesting graph which companies are good ones which companies are the ones you're you like what you're seeing, what you're seeing. You'll be impressed and want to invest in or be a part of their growth. So you all like one company or the other, but you've never thought about their numbers, why, how they how they behave. So in terms of profitability, Apple is sky high. Apple is sky high. They make a lot of profits. Amazon is low. Uh, Alphabet and Facebook are decently profitable, Alphabet paying more than Facebook, Facebook is still not making that much money, Microsoft is not And the one company that makes an awful lot of hard cash money profits today, and is not on a forecast of making profits 5 years, 8 years, 10 years from now, company that makes money today and could be some more of that. Apple is a fiercely, phenomenally, freakishly profitable company. 
will make money and a lot of it today. Google also makes money. Google is also profitable. Facebook is also profitable. Amazon is far less so. Microsoft under control. Keep that input also in mind. In terms of growth prospects and what you see, uh, the number that is wonderful for, for Apple is that they are heavily profitable and there is no visibly dangerous challenger for this or for this big company that are there. They'll, they'll lose market share, they'll gain market share, they'll have new products. They're the market leaders in these categories. They'll continue to make money out of that because they're profitable and fiercely profitable. And the good steady company making a lot of money will continue to do that because they're not doing anything funny. In their product categories, they're the toys. Go Amazon, this is the fastest growing segment that Amazon has seen. Uh, the fastest growing segment that the world is seeing, in, which is the e-commerce wing of selling their products. And they've built their present, they've built spent a lot of money building this. And now they're going, expecting to see a few, quite a few years where they make money, where they actually make big profits. Their best years of money making are ahead of them. But the th thing here is a huge percentage of their revenue come from one pot where they have not yet made money, made that much money. Apple also has a huge percentage of revenue coming from one product, but that is fiercely profitable and, a, and an established market leader. Amazon, slightly less so, but this is where they are the absolutely dominant player. Okay. The other two companies, Alphabet and Facebook, this number and this number, staggering statistic. They are both practically advertising companies. They came out as social media and search companies. They're more ad companies than anything else. Apparently, between them, they account for 90% of all digital ad spend. Digital is gaining share, no doubt about it. But in, within digital, Facebook and Google are own, they own, they own the lion's share of the ad business. They're both advertising companies more than tech companies. That is good because the digital driving share from print is established from all other forms of media is established. They're doing a, a lot of gain, they're having a lot of gains from that shift from print and TV to digital, YouTube and internet. And they're doing so well of the chain that they've now got 90% of this share of the digital media spend. And digital media spend is expected to grow at a substantial pace over the next few years. So they're also on sound footing. But the one thing that they probably need to worry about a little bit at least now is that a huge share of their revenues come from just ads. And probably a larger share of their profits come from the ads. So they're, they're heavily linked to the digital media budget of the world. They have a 90% exposure to the digital media budget and 95% plus of their revenues and profits come from digital media budget. If something were to tip that down, if somewhere they were to collect bad blood, if somebody had to come and establish that the, the return on investment on digital media spent is not half as good as it used to be, or it is not yet as a compelling advantage vis-a-vis -vis printing, or people establish that it is all right, but it's not something that you spend so much money on. Then they are in for, for, for trouble, because they are not only as a big share of their revenues linked to digital media exposure. They are the lion's share in the industry of 90% of spend on digital ads is with one or the other of these two companies. They are completely advertising companies and they are completely digital media budget driven companies. So of all these five companies, these two are probably going to be most vulnerable to some change in just one trend. Digital media spend has a small tweak and they are in trouble. And others are better hedged. The company that is best hedged, the best sh shift in or range of contributors for their revenue. Microsoft Office and Windows Server and Xbox and Hands. So they, their revenues are not heavily dependent on any part of the business, any one thing. And probably the, the least sexy of the five companies that we have seen today. Amazon is the future. Apple has been the 
the dawn of money making. Google and Facebook are the cool cats. Microsoft is this elder statesman who's, who's old in this industry. And we said, look, Microsoft offers how much money can they make? They make a lot of money, and it's not the driver for them. It's not like Google AdWords. It's not like Facebook ads for Facebook. It's, it's about a quarter of their business, not more than that. So they can take a hit in any one segment and live to fight another day because their other segments are doing all right. So the, the mix of revenues is best for them. The mix of profits is also interesting and good. So for all the, the complaints you've seen, I, I did not expect to see the best revenue mix with Microsoft when I saw these charts. But the best revenue mix is with Microsoft. It's also a heavily profitable company. They make money, they're hedged, they're stable, they're present across revenue streams. So probably the most interesting and stable and, and, and kind of a safe bet to, to, to stay alive. We all think Google and Facebook are the future and Microsoft will struggle. It looks like from Prima Facey, from this data, that I would worry about Google and Facebook not surviving as a company. They will. They're good. They're the drivers. You want anything, you go to Google, you want to waste time, you go to Facebook. That, that's clear. The two big drivers for society are anchored and done. But they're, they're more vulnerable to a small twitch here and a small tweak there than Microsoft or Apple. This is a slam thing. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to go on to this idea, which is a fabulous question. Read this question and then we'll discuss this. For which age is the batting average the maximum? As in, if you took the average of all twenty, all batsmen who are age twenty-five, if you took the batting average of all batsmen who are twenty-seven, all batsmen who are twenty-six, all batsmen who are eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and then just took the batting average of the batting average of all the batsmen. So, if you're saying twenty-five-year-old, you take all international batsmen the last year who were twenty-five. Find all their runs, number of tickets they've lost, divide one by the other and get the average. So if you took these averages and compared them, so give us a vague proxy for which age group do batsmen peak? Is that the question that gets answered here? If that were the case, which age did you expect it to peak at? When did you think the guys were prolific? 28, Batman peaks at 28, or 27, 26, 29, the right mix of experience, average table 25, been in interactive cricket for 3 4 years, you break through, you're not fighting for your place, you're settled in, you rack up your double hundreds, and this is the space, this is where Sachin Amesh Tendulkar made most of the runs, of Rahul Dravid, of the Key Ponting, Jack Collis. Is this the age where batsmen peak? More importantly, is that the number that this is going to throw up? It's a fabulous, fabulous data point. Just to say more about, about lies and time statistics, this is a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous data point because the answer is extraordinarily counterintuitive. The age at which batting average for batsmen is maximum is 38. No telling. What could be underpinning the 38? Why are 38 year olds so fabulous? Why do they make so many runs? The average is higher than 28 year olds. It's, it's a beautiful underlying reason there. Uh, one, the database is not going to be high. The guy who's playing international cricket at 38 in all likelihood has had a rich career. And is a great passion. And so there's a sample set bias to the really oldies, not to the 29, 30, 31, 32. There could be quite a few 25, 26, 27 year olds who come on board, who played for two, three years, and then peter off because they've been found out. Or they make a debut at 27 and they and they don't cut it. But if you are playing international cricket at 38, you are bloody good, or you were bloody good not that long ago. It's one aspect of it. So how many cricketers really do bat on till they are 38? If you look at it, you can count them out. You can, you can pick these numbers. And they're all undeniably brilliant. So the guy who survives to 38 is a selection bias. You will get weeded off by the time you reach there. So 
And no matter how well you age, if you are around when you're 38, you're always looking over your shoulder. And you, you, you have the pressures of a 19, 20 year old. Somebody is going to nudge you and say, why don't you retire? Somebody is going to continuously tell you, what is the point of playing beyond this? Your legacy is behind you. Why would you want to spoil it? What that means is, interestingly, 38 year olds pretty much play series by series. If they have a one and a half bad series, they'll drop off, they'll retire, they'll, they'll check it all out and say, look, I've done it, I don't want to continue. So 38 year old who's playing is undeniably a great or flirting with that. A 38 year old who continues to play is undeniably doing a good job because they've retired otherwise. So you had a couple of couple of purple patches from 38 year olds, which is holding up the average. So the 38 is an interesting age where if you survive till then, you're undeniably brilliant. And you're continuing to play every other series. You start at 38, and, and you suppose they say in an average year there are four series. And if you're playing the fourth series, that means you've had an eye on spectacular first three series. But otherwise you would have retired. You either want to retire on a high or you want to do, not be found out all over again by 20 somethings. So you will you are likely to say goodbye. So you're you're being judged on a series to series basis like a 17 year old, 18 year old. So if you are continuing, then you're doing well. And you survived till then, you must have been good. So it's a wonderful, wonderful data point, which is extremely counterintuitive. I would have never thought that the 38 year old years age segment would have the maximum average. Apparently, Graham Gooch personally uh, had something to do with that average number there. The dude came back, had a late inning, brilliant spell in his career, and he, he, he scored a phenomenal number of runs when I mean, she used to be off sitting on a beach with his family. And so that also played a role. But the, the ideas underlying that is brilliant. If you're 38 and still playing, you must have been good. At some point in time, you're flirting with great. If you're 38 and continuing to play, that means you are doing really well. You are great and you're doing well now. What else you need to have a high average? And so, good interesting point there. The the thing that I would say is that don't look at what how the data point could be skewed. And that is, it's very counterintuitive to say the 38 year old average would have been the highest among all the age groups. But the basis for that, once you figure it out, makes it seem like, oh, of course it is 38. How would I miss that? And so, but that's an interesting way of looking at numbers and making inferences and kind of surprising yourself and having an aha moment and saying, oh, interesting, good. Damn neat, that number got me off. And so that's very interesting. So keep looking for that. The one place where you'll find lots of these interesting number based anecdotes this is something called a confectionery stall in, uh, on, on, on cricket. You know, by a guy called Andy Salzman, I think. Very interesting. He's a stand up comic. He writes really well, writes funny columns. But his number based columns are. Uh, perhaps even better than his funny columns. His number-based columns are all about picking this animal. He finds some very interesting anomaly in numbers and then say, look, oh my God, this is fabulous. Did you think it was like that? It is not in your face. Take this. And then explain why that actual statistic is fabulous. And so, good stuff. I'm going to wind up with that there anyway, closing in time. The next session on DI, we're going to come back to real DI, where we solve questions and numbers and roads and puzzles and crack and all of that. But I want to have two sessions where we stand up charts and, and just discuss them. So uh, build this also. I'm not saying this is the bread and butter, but this is important, especially where DI is headed. You should should start enjoying looking at graphs and saying, what does this mean? Oh, might this be a good inference? How do I verify that? Is the article saying this? Is the, art, is the article explaining this thing that vaguely looks like an anomaly? That is important to, to do that. So I'm going to go back and say stop sharing. So we are back to the screen. So I have pretty much covered uh, quite a few types of graphs. We are going to come back and do arithmetic based, computation based DI sooner or later and have some fun with them. Uh, as for today, thanks a lot. Good that we could catch up one other time. And goodbye. See you.